thank you very much for the invitation to give this presentation. So I'm I'm going to tell you a little about work that we're doing in my group at Institut Pasteur, which is uh, a joint group between Ecole Polytechnique and Institut Pasteur, where we are working on uh, doing and uh, using microfluidics and original microfluidics tools to measure the behavior of individual cells, but within 3D cultures. So. Um, what Milena asked me to, to talk a little bit about is microfluidics in general. And so it's true that microfluidics is a subject that we have been talking about for a long time, uh, as something that was going to really have a very strong impact on, on biology, on bioengineering, and on diagnostics, and so on. And so one question that... Okay. that Sorry, Charles, if I uh, stop, I cannot see the screen, and I'm not sure if the other can. Okay. No, I can't uh, see it. No, I think there is uh, no. There's no. Oh, now yes. Uh, okay, so yeah. when I put it in for in, in presentation mode, you can't see it. Uh, okay, so maybe actually the best is to do it this way. Is this okay? Can you see it now? Yes. Yeah. Right. So the question that I'm going to address before talking about our own work is um, here. I'll hide this to keep the suspense. <laughs> Uh, is, is why has it taken so long for microfluidics to reach the market? And the way that you can actually think about this is to compare with other technologies. So if I take a technology that has been extremely fast, that has, that has had a major impact very, very quickly, like computers, for example, then what you can see is that the, the, the first building blocks for making computers, of course, you know, one can go back very long in the past, but um, but you could say that the very first building blocks were the transistors, and the transistors were invented in 1947 in Bell Labs. And it was only 20 years later that uh, that uh, integrated circuits came about, and and the HP calculator, which was kind of the milestone in calculating, was also 20 years after the the creation of transistors. And computers were again 10 years later. So well, computers in the sense of uh, PCs, basically. And then things accelerated and started to go faster, uh, you know, with the World Wide Web and, and so on and so forth. And so in a sense, um, this idea that technology should go faster than what they are going is not so, so obvious. So if I make now the relationship with fluid handling, not, not handling of electrons like in computers, but handling of fluids, which is what we are interested in with microfluidics, um, I guess the state kind of before microfluidics or even today is that we, we go from the tubes that you may hold in your hand and pipette into to a, to a plate that you can use a robot for. And so this, this would be a kind of a very high end robot today, which, is, which has many pipetting tips and can handle many fluids at the same time and so on and so forth. And for me, this is similar to the very old computers that took uh, a complete room and and could do a lot of things for their time, but they would do it in a in a bulky manner. In comparison, what uh, what happens with microfluidics? So the integration of, of fluid handling events, it, it really started in the early 2000s. So in the early 2000s, the basic operations were invented, and those involved pumping, like you see on the left the set of images, or mixing the fluids together, or valving, you know, opening a valve and closing a valve. And so these operations actually, um, they are the, the basic operations on which microfluidics is built. And these operations are not very old. These are about 20 years old now. And, and so once the basic operations were invented, so this is what you see about uh, 2001, 2002, and this is, this is work from Steve Quake's lab at uh, Caltech at the time. Um, what you find is that it was actually fairly quick. Well, once we once Quake invented the valves and and showed that they could pump from this, going to, into an integrated device was rather quick because the computers had already existed and so the idea was already there. And so, in a sense, what this what happened here is that very quickly they they said we're going to take these elements and integrate them into a single device, and so the shrinking the operations but also integrating them on the same chip will allow us to ask new questions and so conceptually the the move from individual device to to say an integrated device was very quick in microfluidics and very quickly out of this came fluidine corporation which actually arrived on the market very 
that, uh, it arrived on a market where, you know, we didn't know really what was going to be the application for this technology. So, so in a sense, the technology itself was mature fairly quickly, but the applications were not. And this is where I think it took a long time for Fluidime to actually find its, its market where it could really have an impact. Of course, this is my my personal view of the technology. So, so uh, you know, it, it can be challenged maybe, but at least this is how I see things. So today, uh, if we look at computers today, what we see is that the basic, you know, PC that we grew up with um, has led to many different types of platforms. It has led to smartphones that everybody has. It has led to computers that are hidden behind uh, you know, a fancy fancy dashboard in a car, but there's a lot of computing power behind that. Or it's or it's a completely different type of device, like supercomputers that take up uh, buildings or data centers that take up buildings. So the basic technology has led to complementary and, and coexisting platforms. And in a sense, this is what I think we will see more and more with microfluidics, where microfluidics is not a single technology, but it's a basic technology that can be actually... Um, applied in many different ways for different types of applications and with different constraints and different needs depending on, on, on the application that, uh, that uh, that's desired. So I'm not sure if somebody has raised their hand. Is that what I'm seeing? No. Okay. So if, if anybody wants to ask a question, please don't hesitate to interrupt me and I'd be happy to discuss anything. All right, so um, so besides the, these early microfluidics developments, there was a second kind type of platform based on microfluidics, which is droplet microfluidics, which we talk about a lot today. But droplet microfluidics is almost as old as the, as the valve microfluidics that I talked about earlier. And droplet microfluidics, so the earliest papers are from 2002, 2003. Um, and, and very very early on, people realized the potential for, actually even Quake wrote a paper in 2001, if I remember correctly. But very early on, people realized that if we made droplets in these microfluidic devices, then these droplets could be used as microreactors in which we could perform biological reactions. However, applying those for, for real life um, applications was, was harder because droplets are kind of tricky little objects because they, they can deform, they can move, and so on and so forth. So so technically, this was a little bit more difficult than making the valves and, and, and closing little chambers in that way. And here I'm just showing a few of the early articles. This is not supposed to be a complete bibliography, but you can see that the people invented operations and different labs invented different types of operations in order to apply droplets for biological assays. And this has led to some very successful transfers to industry. Um, Quanta Life was a startup, I think, in California. Raindance was a startup uh, out of Harvard. Um, those were the early droplet microfluidic uh, companies that, that, uh, that were both acquired by Biorad later. Um, Stila Technologies emerged from our lab, so I'm a co-founder, so I'm a little bit biased in this discussion. Uh, and, and of course, we, we're talking a lot about 10x genomics, which is kind of the, the biggest uh, success story so far, maybe out of microfluidics. And so, ten, and so all of these startup companies, which are now, a lot of them are not startups anymore, um, are based on the ability to generate droplets. And then the question becomes, what do you put inside of the droplets in order to give you an answer to a biological question, rather than just showing that you can make droplets? So, so this step is the one that has taken a lot of time to actually reach a market is what do you put in the droplets and what question do you ask that you can answer with this platform? Okay, so um, once I've said all of this, maybe we can talk about droplet microfluidics a little bit more in detail. So it has many strengths. One of the strengths that, uh, that droplet microfluidics has is that it's easy to generate a lot of droplets. So depending on the exact platform you're making, you can make thousands or, or, or even millions of droplets in a reasonable amount of time. So this allows you to get access to statistical quantities that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise. The encapsulation, so the ability to put something inside of the droplets and keep it inside, that's very important. And um, so if you put cells inside the drops, you know that the cells will not leave the droplet. This is, this is one of the effects. 
And then people have uh, developed tools to manipulate the droplets. One of them is to sort the drops. So select the ones that are of interest and the ones that are not of interest, to add things to them by merging two droplets together and so on. And so these are some of the major strengths, but then uh, associated with that are some weaknesses. One of them is that you cannot really manipulate adherent cells in the droplets. You cannot keep adherent cells for a long time because they will just die. Um, it's also difficult to, to keep the droplets stationary a priori, so that it's difficult to see the time evolution of something inside of the droplets. And then uh, really one of the major difficulties with droplets is that if you just want to have one operation in droplets, like for example, sorting the drops or, or just merging them together, uh, there are some robust uh, microfluidic devices that do that. But if you want to do two or more operations on a train of droplets, that becomes very, very complicated. And so uh, I think maybe there's one company that's um, developing this, but I'm not sure that that's such an easy thing to do. And this means that the operations that one would like to make on the droplets it's difficult to integrate them on a single device. And what ends up happening is that most of the devices that you can buy, they contain, you have different chips to do different operations. So this is where um, we wanted to work, where we wanted to try to answer these, these kind of shortcomings of droplet microfluidics. And so we wanted to combine the advantages of the fluidine device where the fluids are stationary inside of a chip but then with the advantages of the droplets where we could make them easily, the chips would be cheaper to make, more, more robust. And so try to get kind of the best of these two worlds. Um, so this is where we started working on droplet microfluidics driven by confinement gradients. So I will explain first what, what the physics is of this device is very, very quickly. And then I will, go, I will go through a couple of examples of how we can apply this for single cell measurements inside of the droplets. And please, again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to interrupt me. So the basic idea behind uh, energy gradients is the following. The idea is that if I have a droplet, uh, let's, for example, take this green droplet, which is, uh, just imagine it's a water droplet surrounded by oil. So the orange fluid is oil and the green fluid is water. And if I squeeze the droplet between two walls, then I will change the surface area of the droplet. And by default, what the fluids intend to do is to minimize their surface area. And so the, the default situation that the droplet would like to be in is to be as spherical as possible to minimize the surface area surrounding it. And so if I put the droplet in a gradient of confinement where it's more confined on the left and less confined on the right, then it will feel a force. And the force is simply equal to the gradient of the surface energy. And this is very classical physics. There's nothing new here, uh, but it's actually uh, interesting to remember this. And the way that we use it is to make, so, so there are different ways to apply this, but what, what I'm going to show you today is that we can make channels that are thin everywhere. So this is a cross section of a microfluidic device. And so the cross section is, has a, a small height everywhere except that locally we can make little holes in the, in the channel where the droplet can actually release some of its confinement. So the droplet can go into this little hole. And by doing so, the droplet that's over this hole actually reduces its surface energy compared to when it is far away from the hole. And again, this is classical physics. What this tells you is that the energy is lower when the droplet is above the hole than when the droplet's far away. And this means that if the droplet is above the hole, it will be attracted to it. And so if I try to push it out, it will come back to, to this location where it minimizes its surface energy. All this is, is kind of a fancy way to say that if I allow the droplet to become more spherical, it will try to stay there. It will, it will be squeezed and it will be kind of blocked in this position. Right, so um, how does this work in practice? This is a... This is a microfluidic device. This is one of the earliest exper experiments that we did on this, where we are going to make the droplets on the left, and the drops arrive in a chamber that's very wide. And in the middle of the chamber, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but in the middle of the chamber, we have a small uh, hole in the bottom of the channel. And so when the droplets arrive above this hole, then they are stuck there. And so the other droplets continue flowing, but this one actually is stuck in the hole. Can you see the movie, by the way? 
Yes, it works well. Okay, yes. super. So this is an actual experiment. It's it's and, and it's not a loop. The droplet that's stuck, uh, the other ones continue around it. And so we call these anchors. Um, and so since this is made using microfabrication techniques like lithography, for example, if you can make a single anchor, then you can make many of them. And this is also one of the early experiments where we have many of these little holes in the bottom of the channel. And then we bring a lot of droplets and you can see that very, very easily. You can just put place the droplets into an array where they just stay there. And this way you can actually observe them for very long times. And this is in real time. So what you can see is that in real time you can have hundreds or thousands of droplets in a few in a few seconds or a few minutes just placed at, at regular locations in a two-dimensional array. <clears throat> so this is the basic technology where we can place the droplets into particular arrays. And as I was telling you earlier, so getting the technology to work is, is kind of the easy part, but the, then the most difficult part is to ask what can you learn once you have this technology. And so this is something that we've been working on for about six or seven years in my lab. And I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of what you can learn by using stationary droplets. So the first thing that you can do is to make a large array of droplets like this. So this is a chip that is about, that basically fits on a, on a microscope slide. So, so it's about two centimeters long and about uh, five or eight millimeters wide. And in this chip, we will actually place what we call, you know, these anchors in a regular fashion. <clears throat> the anchors are about 120 microns in, in the side is about 120 microns, and they are spaced by about 200 microns. Uh, and all of this is, is on a microscope slide. So by doing this, we get about 1500 anchors in a two centimeter squared area. So what we can do here, this is a slightly different way of making the droplets, but what you're going to see is again a real-time movie where you, you can see the small square anchors. This is where the droplets are going to be stuck. And what you're seeing uh, on the edges of the channel is the interface between the water phase and the oil phase. So the oil phase is on the outside and the water phase is on the inside. And when we fill the channel in, in a particular way, then what you can see is that by pushing the oil into the water, we can make an array of water drops that are mo mostly the same size as each other and that are just stuck in very well-defined positions. And so again, I'll play the movie a second time. And what you can see is that it it's, it's automatically generates uh, about 1,500 droplets in about two minutes or three minutes. And the droplets are fairly monodispersed. They're not 100% monodispersed, but they're pretty good. They're maybe, there's maybe 5% polydispersity or something like this. So once we've done this, we can we can make these droplets with um, we can make these droplets with bacteria inside them, for example, in culture medium. And if we do this, then this is what happens. So we can place the bacteria inside of these droplets, and we can incubate them at 37 degrees. And what you see is that the bacteria start to grow and divide inside of these droplets. And each droplet then contains a colony of bacteria. And if we just have water droplets, then, then the bacteria grow into an amorphous colony that occupies the whole droplet. Alternatively, we can also play with hydrogels, so we can make a gel droplet. And in these gel droplets, the bacteria will grow into a condensed kind of a sphere of, of, of cells that grows um, almost like, like mammalian cells, so, so that grows almost like a biofilm. Um, and this game can be played with, with anything you put in the droplets. You can put, so we've tried this with many different types of bacteria. And what you see here is that we can take images at regular times, either in bright field or in fluorescence. So if the bacteria are fluorescent, then we can measure the intensity level of the fluorescence and we can observe how this grows with time. So one point that's important here is that we start with a dilute sample of cells. And this means that in every particular droplet, we have a small number of cells initially. And depending on how much we dilute the sample, we can either have, uh, well, we have a Poisson distribution of, of number of cells per droplet. And so basically, depending on the average number of cells per droplet, we will have some empty drops. And then we will have some drops with one cell, some drops with two, four, three, four, and so on. 
And so we can tune the number of initial bacteria per cell, not exactly for every droplet, but uh, in an average sense. So we can tune the, the average parameter of the Poisson distribution. And this we verified several times that it does follow a Poisson distribution. And so by knowing the number of positive droplets that have cells inside them and the number with no cells inside them, we know what's the average number of cells per droplet. And so if we look again at this, um, at this intensity of the fluorescence level, what we can find is that for each one of the droplets, that contain bacteria, we have uh, an exponential increase of the number of cells per droplet, of, or, or also the fluorescent intensity. Until so, initially we start with a lag phase, and then the fluorescent intensity increases exponentially, and then it saturates once the cells run out of uh, nutrients in each one of the droplets. <clears throat> but what's interesting here is that from a single experiment, we can get about a thousand parallel growth curves for bacteria and, and, the same, and the same device. And what this means is that we can look at heterogeneity of the growth between the different cells. So we spent a lot of time at looking at the math behind this problem, and we can relate, to some extent, we can relate the heterogeneity of the growth curves with the heterogeneity within the population of, of cells. So, um, so now we can, so, so, so in this image, what I showed you was how colonies grow, the dynamics of growth out of an individual cell. But we can also play kind of simpler games and just count the number of positive droplets. So I was, as I was telling you earlier, um, by counting the number of droplets that contain cells and the number of droplets that do not contain cells, I know on average how many cells are present in each one of the droplets. And so if I don't use any antibiotic, I can run this experiment and I can get um, a certain concentration of cells in my initial sample. And now I can, I can work with increasing concentrations of antibiotics. And what I find is that I can actually get fewer and fewer droplets that are positive until I have exactly zero droplets that are positive. And so this is a way to determine the MIC, which is a very important measure for microbiologists. However, contrary to different methods of producing the MIC, I can actually detect that even very close to the MIC, I have some positive droplets. And so some of the work that we're doing now in the lab is to understand why, what is particularly special about the cells that were present in these droplets, that they actually survived at a relatively high concentration of antibiotic, while others did not survive. And so by working with this type of device, we're able to ask questions now about the, the heterogeneity of response to antibiotic on the single cell level for bacteria. Okay, so now I'm going to switch to the last subject uh, that I'm going to talk about today, which is 3D cell culture, spheroids and organoids. So this, this is work that has been published very recently. So two papers came out earlier this year and one paper in 2017. And the, the motivation for this work is that in traditional cell culture, um, Usually we culture cells in, in petri dishes or in, in multi-well plates, and they look something like this. And the kind of the observation is that these cells do not represent very well what the situation in vivo, because what you know is that in vivo the, the spatial organization of the cells actually gives them the, the phenotype, the global phenotype of the of the organism. And so as you can see, even though you share the same cells as, as the different individuals, you have a very different phenotype. Um, and it's unpredictable, you know, how the three-dimensional organization is going to actually change the phenotype. So we want to work in 3D. And one of the simple systems of working in 3D is to work with cell spheroids. And um, a classical way of making spheroids is to use the hanging drop technique, where the, you, you place a droplet of, of aqueous solution on the bottom of a plate, and you put cells inside of this droplet. And by gravity, the cells will sediment to the bottom, and then they will meet each other in the center because the droplet is curved. And then once they meet each other, then they will make a spheroid. And this spheroid is not just an aggregate of cells. It's actually a functional unit. The cells will organize themselves within the spheroid so that they have a different function on the outside than on the inside. And this is very, very important. This is how three-dimensional culture is different from two-dimensional culture. 
So these hanging drop techniques actually exist. You can buy them. You can you can get them commercially. But <clears throat> what we wanted to do is to do this in microfluidics. So I'm going to show you how we do this. Um, we do it in a chip that's like this. Again, this is a microscope slide. And we have a little uh, trapping and observation region, cell culture region, which is about two centimeters squared. And that contains a few hundred anchors, like the ones I showed you earlier. Here, we're going to produce the droplets in this entrance region. We're going to transport them. And then, and then this region is simply going to serve to kind of distribute them laterally so that we fill efficiently the, the anchors inside of the chip. So I'll show you a movie of how this works. Um, what we are looking at in the picture right now is, I don't know if you see my mouse, but if you count, if you count the entrance holes from the right to the left, we are looking at the third entrance hole. This is where we're going to make the droplets. So this movie again is in real time. The liquid is an aqueous cell culture medium that contains cells and the outside fluid is oil. And so here we go. Ready, set, go. This is the droplet production. Here we go. We have produced the droplets. And what you can see is that if you control well your flows, then you can make very monodispersed droplets from the beginning. Now we're in the cell, we're now in the rails region, so in which we distribute the cells laterally. And what you see is that the droplets, each one of the droplets contains here, in this case, about 150 cells on average, although there's some distribution of number of cells. And then now we are reaching the region with the anchors, which are these hexagonal structures. And when the droplets reach the anchors, they actually sink in, inside them, and they will stay there for the rest of the experiment. And again, this is in real time. So as you can see, in a, in a few tens of seconds, we start filling maybe a quarter of the chip. And the filling the whole chip takes about five minutes. So, so in five minutes, we filled a few hundred anchors with exactly one droplet per anchor, and on average, about 150 cells per droplet. <coughs> right, so once we've done this, once the anchors are filled, then we can stop the flows. And let's let the cells sediment to the bottom of the droplets, just like in a hanging drop system. And now we're looking at the time lapse movie overnight, over 24 hours. And what we see is that the cells start to interact with each other. And as they interact, they start making cell cell junctions with each other and building their extracellular matrix. And so over about 24 hours, we see that we go from a very rough kind of monolayer of cells into a very nice sphere. And as a matter of fact, if you want to really see that it's a sphere, you can use the microfluidics to rotate the contents of the droplet. So if I flow fluid on oil, this will create a rotation inside of the droplet. And this rotation allows you to look at all of the different uh, sides of the, of the spheroid. And you can really see that it's a, it's a nice ball of cells and that the cells are really making nice tight junctions between each other. And so we've done this with many different cell types. These are the MSC, so mesenchymal cells. And, and so it works with the, many, with the wide range of cell types. Now we're going to play a trick. We're going to use hydrogels inside of the droplets. And then we're going to gel the, this hydrogel. And this allows us to remove the oil and replace it with an aqueous medium. So this is an aqueous medium that's replacing the oil. And this is going to be important for several reasons. The first reason is that if we want to keep the cell culture for a long time, it allows us to bring uh, it allows us to bring cell culture medium so that we can maintain the culture for a long time. It's also important because we can bring different markers, different antibodies, and so we can do the immunohistochemistry or immunocytochemistry on these cells without moving them from the microfluidic chip in which they are. We can bring drugs as well. We can bring many, many different, anything basically that's water soluble. We can bring it with this external medium and allow it to diffuse into the gel beads, into the cells. And so in practice, what we do a lot is that we do this immunocytochemistry. Uh, and, and so everything is done on the same chip on all of the spheroids in parallel. So we do hundreds of them in parallel. And what this allows us to do is that very efficiently we can stain the different cells and we can we can bring different stainings and and be able to measure with quantitative microscopy the positions and of the and the expression level of different molecules and so this is an example of such a spheroid this is one chip this is this is now old data we have 
prettier pictures now than this, but, but it, it gives you the basic idea. The basic idea is that on a single experiment, we have between 250 and 500 parallel spheroids in which we are seeing individual cells in each one of the spheroids. And so what this allows us to do from image analysis is what we call multi-scale cytometry, which means that we can measure things on the level of the whole population. We can measure things on the level of each one of the individual spheroids, and we can measure things at the level of each one of the cells inside each one of the spheroids. And so this kind of <clears throat> knowing what the cells are doing within the spheroids within the population allows us to ask new types of questions that are related to the three-dimensional structure of the spheroid. So this is just showing we can make measurements on the secretion from the, all of the spheroids at once. And, and we can also do quantita quantification of, of, the, of the production of albumin in this case, depending on the shape of the spheroids. And we can see that, so, so this is 5,000 spheroids that we are able to correlate the shape with the production of albumin. And you can see that there's a nice correlation here. And then to look at inside the spheroids, then we can, we can get really hundreds of thousands of cells while keeping the information of their position inside of the spheroids. And so we can get fax quality data. So this is almost like a quality of data that's similar to flow cytometry, but we keep the information about where the cells are within each one of the spheroids. And so now we would like to play more complicated games. For example, we would like to know not just the position, not just the radio position of the cell, but who are its neighbors. And so one of the things that we've done was to construct these Voronoi constructions where we can determine um, mathematically which cells are on the edge, well, and then which ones are on the second layer, the third layer, the fourth layer, and so on and so forth. And so we can relate the size, the shape, and the phenotype, so, so the production of different molecules by the cells, depending on their position within these spheroids. And so this is just an example of, of what you can learn from this. What you can learn is that um, the, the the different, different molecules, so, so these are mesenchymostromal cells, and what they do is that they have much stronger cell-cell junctions on the edge, and you have the strong fibers of actin that are actually keeping the spheroids together on the edge of the, of the spheroids. But on the inside of the spheroids, the actin is not polymerized, and so what you find is a lower level of phylloidin expression, and, and you see that the cells really produce molecules differently um, depending on their position in these 3D structures. So I won't go into the biology of this, but we can learn really new biology by looking at the, at the, at the structure and at the same time, the biological function of the cells within these three-dimensional structures. But the, so, so going back to the technology, um, what I've showed you so far is, is a system where you do the same operation on all of the spheroids in the device. And we wanted to actually do different types of operations. And so we invented the version 2.0 of the anchors, where now instead of having a, a round anchor, we have an anchor with a slightly elongated nose on the side. And by doing this, we can now have a large droplet in the large part of the anchor, but we keep the position open so that we can bring a second droplet at a later moment. And this is important because it's going to allow us to add different things to different positions in the, in the device. So this is just to make pretty pictures. What you see is that we've made large droplets that, with food coloring, and the food coloring goes from yellow to blue by going through different levels of green between them. And we've made smaller droplets that we brought later on that go from transparent to deep red by going through levels of pink in the middle. And by bringing these droplets together and then merging, merging them together, we can have different conditions and the different positions in the chip. And this is a really experimental image, but it's just food coloring, but it shows you that we have different conditions in different positions. We, what we would really like to do is to make a steroid inside of a big droplet. And then at some later time, the next day or two days later, or however long later we want, we would like to bring a second droplet that contains different things in different droplets. So we would like to bring a library of droplets that we can then merge with the first one. And so this is really what we do. This is a paper that was published just a couple of weeks ago in Cell Reports. This is what we can do with this platform. We can make the first droplet that contains cells and the cells will make a spheroid. And then the next day, we can bring a second droplet that contains cells and we can make a spheroid inside of the second droplet as well. And then when we merge the droplets together, the spheroids will merge together. 
And when that happens, what you find is that we can make a heterospheroid, so a spheroid made up of, made up of two different cell types, so uh, uh, the non-colored cells and then these kinds of magenta cells. And then we can repeat this operation. We can bring down a third droplet that contains green cells, and by merging things together, we can make, again, a more complex structure where we have different cells of different ages or different types or different color that we can merge together to make a complex three-dimensional structure. And again, the interesting thing here is that we're doing this hundreds of times on a chip, and so we can get a lot of statistics from these experiments. So the experiment that I just showed you is just kind of a proof of concept with the same cell type, just colored differently. So you get randomly structured uh, spheroids. But if you make uh, structures with particular cell types, so here we have MSCs, this mesenchymal cells that we're merging with a cancer cell line, so PC3 cancer cell line, what you get is a core shell structure where the cells organize uh, in a non-random fashion. You always have one cell type on the outside and a different cell type on the inside. So in this way, you can imagine really building tissues uh, in a progressive manner. Uh, so those were, those were synergistic uh, interactions. You can also make antagonistic interactions. And so here we're making cells, uh, we're, we're making a spheroid of cancer cells that we're uh, challenging with immune cells. And this is a project that's ongoing in the lab where we can see that the immune cells, this is just a proof of concept, but in the lab we're seeing uh, different types of cell interactions where the immune cells are really killing the cancer cells in models of immunotherapy. Or you can look at host pathogen interactions where you have, where you have uh, a spheroid of, of, of of mammalian cells that is being challenged by bacteria. And, and again, the bacteria, you can see that they actually infect and they kill the spheroid inside of the droplet. Um, and then just to finish with the last type of application, we can also screen drugs, or at least we can screen um, different concentrations of a drug on the same chip. This is a, an experiment where I'm just showing you a small part of a chip where we have six different spheroids. The next day after the spheroids are made, we can bring droplets that contain different concentrations of a drug. And we know which concentration is where because we add also a fluorophore to the, to the droplet so that we, we can relate the color of the droplet with the concentration that we have inside of it. So these are just uh, a few positions, but the actual chip looks like this. This is a complete chip. You have 250 spheroids where we, we basically were covering three decades of concentration of the drug. And by looking at the color, we are able to know which concentration is at which position. And by doing this experiment, what we can do is we can see as a function of time and as a function of concentration of drug, that when we have a large concentration of the drug, we have the spheroids that die, uh, and you see a lot of cell death in here. When you have a low concentration of the drug, the cell spheroids are very happy and all the cells are alive. And between the two, we have these typical uh, IC50 curves where we are seeing when is, the, when is the drug efficient. What's interesting here is that for the same concentration of drugs, we have very uh, heterogeneous conditions. So we can see that we can, we can, again, ask questions about heterogeneity and the biological sample. Um, we can also look at inside of each one of the spheroids how things are going. So I think I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to summarize. Um, so what I've tried to show you is that we have a microfluidic platform in which we can really do 3D culture. We can produce the spheroids, culture them, change their environment, stain them, observe them. We can recover them in some cases, but I, I won't show you this today. We get a lot of data on the single cell level, but while preserving the information about where is the cell inside of the spheroids. And the next steps are going to be to look at immunotherapy applications, organoids, uh, organoid chip type applications. And these are things that are ongoing in the lab right now. Um, okay, so I will finish just by, by, by uh, who did all of the work. So, so Raphael Tomasi and, and Cyprien Germont-Pré were the people who, the two students who really initiated the work, along with Sébastien Sarr and Gabriel Amselem. And there's actually really a long list of, of, of people in the group and also um, collaborators at Pasteur and elsewhere that we have been fortunate to work with. And thank you very much for your attention. And I'm really happy to take any questions. Thank you, Charles. Are there any questions in the chat? No. 
So I, I have a question, Charles. Can you recover the cells and or the targeted spheroids from the chip? Yeah, yeah, so you can do this in two ways. You can do this uh, in a very high-tech way, um, which uh, <coughs> the, 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 the trick that we have developed is that since we use hydrogels that are sensitive to temperature, then if we heat the sphero, if we heat the hydrogel, then, um, then you can actually melt one of the droplets and then recover that particular sphero. So this is one way that we've done it. And the truth is that it's kind of difficult. It's kind of a difficult way to recover spheroids. But actually what works very well is that these are PDMS chips. You can open the chip and go with a cell picker and you can pick individually. These, the, the actual positions are sufficiently far from each other that it's very easy actually to pick the spheroids individually. And this is really what becomes um, more practical. This is what we've done for more practical cases. Okay. And it's, it's not so difficult. It's really quite easy. Are there any other questions? Okay, thank you, Charles. Just to say that uh, an instrument based on the technology that Charles just described will be available at the Cytometry and Biomarkers UTEC sometimes in autumn. So you are very welcome to contact us and uh, explore the advantages of the system. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.